I, I am very pleased to ask Professor Yuval Perez to give his talk. In the last few years, he gave quite a few talks in Hungary, and we learned a lot. I am sure that this international audience will learn also from his talk a lot. Please. Do you hear me in the back? People in the back, yes? OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> good morning. It's, a, of course, a pleasure and an honor to be here. And we're all grateful to Paul Erders for starting, pioneering so many fields, and I'm Personally, I also want to express my gratitude to my uh, teachers, Hillel Fürstenberg and Benji Weiss. Um, so the topic uh, that I'm discussing is based on joint work with Wilhelm Schlag, Yakov Babichenko, Ron Peret, Perla Susi, and Peter Winkler. As you can see the, from the long title, I had trouble deciding what exactly to talk about, but it's actually worse than it looks because initially I was thinking I really should discuss the amazing collaboration of Dvoretsky, Erdos, and Kakutani, uh, foundational work on fine properties of Brownian paths. Um, so <laughs> before I realized I don't even have time to mention it, but um, so. So in particular, following pioneering work of Paul Levy, they continued to analyze Brownian motion in higher dimensions, finding fantastic intersection properties. For instance, that Brownian motion in the plane will have some points of uncountable multiplicity. So there are points that are visited so many times that that's the cardinality of the continuum. And analyzing intersections in any dimension as well. Um, this theme was continued by many probabilists, most notably James Taylor and uh, Jean-Francois Legal. <laughs> so as I said, I don't have time to go into this, but I do have uh, one story to tell you about this, the last paper on points of increase. So here's a graph of a Brownian motion, look at the green graph. So over a unit interval, this graph must have some maximum. And it's easy to see this maximum is, will be unique. Now, you know, Brownian motion is agnostic over going up or down, right? So suppose you reflect the Brownian motion at this maximum point, then you get the path that you see, which is green on the left and blue on the right. So that path at this point has, this is what's called the point of increase. It's a maximum to the left and a minimum to the right. Now, of course, there's an issue whether you can really do this reflection legally. So we know the maximum points. Are there points of increase? This was the question, one of the questions that this remarkable trio, Dvoretsky, Erdos, Kakutani, uh, considered. This was in 1961. And the paper they published says, you know, non-increase everywhere of the Brownian motion process. So that point of increase shouldn't exist. And this is the review by Lamperti, uh, who says that, <laughs> right, so path of this, it was already well known by the 1960s that Brownian paths are nowhere differentiable. But this was considered a finer property that the, almost all Brian and Pass have no points of increase. The original proof was very intricate. There were other proofs. Uh, some simpler ones are by uh, Chris Birdsey, who's here in 1990. And uh, I also published a proof based on analyzing points of increase for random walks, showing the probability of such a point 
goes to zero and deducing the classical result from that. But the reason I want to tell you this story is when I was a postdoc in, at Yale, uh, Shizuo Kakutani told me that, in fact, initially in 1960, they were trying to, uh, they first believed that there will be points of increase, and they tried to prove it by establishing some fancy version of the reflection principle, showing that you can actually reflect at the maximum. And at some point late in the, you know, eight or nine in the evening, they thought they had succeeded. Uh, so then uh, they were working in Dvoretsky's apartment in New York, where Erdős was also staying. And then when they concluded successfully this proof that there exists point of increase, uh, Kakutani went down to his car to drive to New Haven, to Yale. But the car wouldn't start. I managed to find a picture of the car. And the car wouldn't start. So after many trials, it was too late to call you know, the garage. So he went back to Dvoretsky's apartment and told him, well, I have to stay with you until tomorrow morning. And um, so as they were settling in, they discussed the fine points of the proof they had just concluded. They found some small gaps. They corrected them. New gaps appeared, and so on and so forth, until about 3 AM, this process concluded with them proving the opposite of what they had initially, initially thought. And they, they went to sleep. And if you look at that original paper, you can really see at which hour, which hour it was written. But uh, uh, anyway, at the 9 AM the next morning, uh, Kakutani goes to his car. Before calling the garage, he makes one more attempt. It turns on no problem. <laughs> and he just drove off. So further, so this theme of fine paths of uh, fine properties of Brown and paths has, uh, as I said, been continued a lot. And in particular, there's the beautiful lecture notes by Jean-Francois Legal. Um, and this is, uh, so you can find them on Amazon, but uh, Jean-Francois just told me that they are freely available on his webpage as well. Uh, I also wrote a book with Peter Murters on Brian Motion, which has a large emphasis on uh, properties of, fine properties of the sample paths and of the mostly highly visited points. That was another topic that Erdős as well as uh, the uh, chair of today's session, uh, Paul Revesh, really uh, liked uh, these uh, points of high, of high multiplicity in random walks and burning motion. So, and this one is also freely available on the web. OK, so that's about the topic that I decided not to talk about. And I wanted to tell you something that would be perhaps closer to many people here. Um, uh, some interesting uses of the probabilistic method in connection with some uh, problems of Erdős. So here is a particular Kelly graph defined by a sequence. So given, think of an increasing sequence of integers n k, and which we also call s. Uh, and so this is this is this sequence. And we define a, a graph where two integers are connected if their difference is in the given sequence. So one nice example to keep in mind is if the sequence is just a sequence of powers, say k cubed, okay, then a Fermat's last theorem tells you that this graph can have no triangles, right? Because if you think about what would the triangle in this graph mean, it would mean that some some, if you look at the edges of the triangle, it would mean that you have a solution to x to the d plus y to the d equals z to the d. So there are no triangles. On the other hand, there is a theorem proved independently by Furstenberg and Sarkozy uh, uh, by very different methods. So Sarkozy's, uh, Furstenberg's methods were ergodic, and uh, Sarkozy's uh, were more specialized and more, which gave better quantitative bounds. But the, 
what I want to mention from the result is for any set of positive, dense, positive upper density, so the fraction the set takes up in 1 to n, divide by n, that has a positive limb soup. For any such set, you can solve inside the set x minus y equals k cubed or any fixed power you want. And, uh, okay, so that Im implies that any independent set in this graph, any set where there are no edges between vertices in the set, must have upper density zero. In other words, density zero. And in particular, this can also be deduced from other things, this graph must have infinite chromatic number. Because if you could color, if you had a proper coloring in finitely many colors, certainly one of the color classes would have to have positive upper density. And it would be an independent set. So this graph has infinite chromatic number for polynomial sequences. So with that as background, to mention Erdős's question from 1987, so he asked in a conference, I think in Paris, but I don't, I'm not sure. Um, so suppose the sequence is, grows faster than polynomially, so it's a lacunary sequence, which means that the ratios between successive elements are bigger than some one plus epsilon. Okay, so suppose you have a sequence like that, and now you define the graph as before. So integers are connected if their difference is in the sequence nj. <laughs> now you look at the chromatic number, the smallest number of colors in a proper vertex coloring, and ask, well, I guess Erdős asked, is, it, is, is this finite? As uh, noticed by Chris Nelson during this conference, that's closely related to uh, another question, which I think was independently raised by Erdős some years before, in 1975. Um, this is a, so problem A is a question in kind of infinite graph. Problem B is a question in Diophantine approximation. You're given a sequence NJ, a lacunary sequence, and you want to find the number theta so that NJ theta is not dense. So this contrasts with, you know, Kronecker's theorem tells you that if you take the sequence of all integers, NJ equals J, then uh, for, uh, so I said, right, so I guess I should have emphasized I want theta to be irrational. Thank you. So, so if you take J to be, uh, so we want theta here to be irrational. Um, in fact, what I'll care about is that NJ theta stays bounded away from the integers. So that was the right formula. That was the right formulation for my purpose is can you find the theta where nj theta stays bounded away from the integers? And in that formulation, of course, a rational theta is no better than, than another one. So Kronecker's theorem tells you that if theta is irrational, j theta will be dense, and then there are extensions by uh, Vail and others that say that, you know, if you take nj to be the polynomials, then it's still dense and equidistributed. There is a famous theorem of Furstenberg that if you take nj to be the semigroup generated by 2 and 3, then that also multiplied by any irrational is dense. So that's something that increases faster than polynomially, but still is not lacunary. So Erdős's question was about the lacunary sequence. And I should mention that this is very easy if the lacunary sequence is very lacunary, if these ratios are strictly bigger than two. You, it's really just an exercise to construct this data. Kind of, um, but, and I'm, I'm sure Erdős realized this, but the question is if nj is lacunary, but you know, with this very small epsilon, can you still find such a theta? So what is the connection between these two problems? So that connection is actually very close to, some, to a Erdős's 1965 paper that Ben Green told us about. 
So let me explain the connection. So suppose that theta in J not only is not dense, but as I said, is bounded away from zero when you take it mod one. So theta in J is bounded away from the integer. So the norm here is the distance to the integer. That's the number theorist's norm. And Okay, so suppose that now partition the unit interval, or really the circle, into k intervals of length 1 over delta. And now use this partition to color the integers. So you color, you assign a vertex n in the integers, the color j, if n theta falls in the jth interval in this partition. Okay? And with this coloring, any two vertices that are connected by an edge, if uh, n and m are connected by an edge, it means that n theta and m theta fell in the same interval, which means n minus m um, you know, times, times theta is less than delta away from the integers, which means n minus m could not be in our sequence because we assume that the sequence had this separation, norm of, theta, norm of theta and j should be bigger than delta. So this indeed gives a proper coloring and gives a connection between the two problems. If you can, uh, so to make it quantitative, the larger the delta you can make in this Diophantine problem, the better the coloring, that is the chromatic number, will be bounded by one over delta. Okay? This, this is kind of key. So if this is not clear, please stop me and I'll say it again. All right, so you, so, and this is actually very close to the way, uh, to the argument that Ben Green told us about a few days ago. All right, so this is the connection between the two problems, and I think both of them are interesting on their own, but the fact that they have this connection makes both of them more interesting. So, so problem B was solved uh, by, after, you know, after it was sol posed by Erdős in 75, it was solved by Pollington in 79, Demassan 1980, and there's also a solution given in Katz-Nelson 2001. All these solutions are quantitative, but in fact, uh, it turns out, and this, uh, this is something I only learned a couple of years ago from Moshe Vitin, is that Kinchin in 1926 considered the same, the very same Diophantine approximation problem and solved it getting as good a quantitative solution as Katz-Nelson did in 2001 and better than Pollington and Demathan got in 79 and 80. And um, so the solution of, that Kinchin and Katz-Nelson got gave that the minimum, so remember the sequence is one plus epsilon lecanary and they got the delta to be essentially epsilon squared with a log correction. Okay, so they found some irrational theta, indeed, uncountably many such irrational thetas, so that the norm of theta and j is at least constant epsilon squared times a log. And this means that, again, up to a logarithmic correction, you can, the chromatic number of this graph is at most uh, one over epsilon squared again, with a log correction. Okay. Um, so, so I, <coughs> I uh, worked on this with uh, Wilhelm Schlag, and we managed to improve this bound. So instead of epsilon squared, we have epsilon still with a log correction. So again, under the same condition, the sequence is one plus epsilon lacunary, one can get a number of theta, indeed uncountably many, where this infimum is bigger than constant epsilon over log epsilon. And that implies a bound for the chromatic number, which is almost linear in one over epsilon. So it's like log one over epsilon over epsilon. Okay, and I'll explain where this comes from in a minute, but uh, let me mention that this is 
So the only possible improvement is removing this log now because, <laughs> say for the chromatic number question, if you just start your sequence, you know, one, two, three, four, up to one over epsilon, and then continue in any way which, say, uh, which is one plus epsilon lacunary, so, you know, multiply by two every time if you like, <laughs> just the presence of these numbers, of course, forces you to have at least one over epsilon different color classes. So, so it means that the chromatic number has to be at least one over epsilon. And so the uncertainty remaining is whether this log is needed or not. And so that's one open problem I wanted to pose here. Is, the, is this is somehow arithmetic progression the optimal choice of a lacunary sequence for this problem. Because, I mean, what I did, what I wrote down with this sequence, if you do put down any arithmetic progression, you get the same, same effect. So, if that's true. Now, how, how does this solution go? Now, there's a long tradition going back to the original use, and you can find more in the Alon Spencer book of using the Lovas local lemma to um, to get good to get good colorings, and this is what we'll do, but with a twist. That is, we'll use the Lovas local lemma, but in the Diophantine problem, which will then yield a good coloring. So there's an even longer tradition of relating lacunarity to independence. So I think back to going back to Hadamar, who was looking at a lacunary power series, uh, and, and followers, it, it was a theme that was justified in various ways that lacunarity is some version of almost independence. On the other hand, we know that the Lovas local lemma, which I'll recall a version for you in a moment, is also something that tries to capture almost independence, and it turns out that these two match very well. So here is another formulation of, of our result. So again, you have a lacunary sequence. You look at sets Ej. So these are sets in the unit interval, so that the norm of Nj theta is smaller than constant epsilon over log 2 epsilon. So I wrote less than, but maybe it's better if you think of less equal to get, well, no, let's put less than because we want the complement to be close. Okay, so let's keep it as I wrote here. And then the statement is that for these sets AJ, the intersection of the complement is non-empty. And in fact, it's going to be a large set. So if you think about it, the complements, if you intersect the complements, you'll get exactly get, if a point is in the intersection of the complements, it exactly gives us what we want. The complement of this means that the norm of Nj theta is greater or equal than this ratio of epsilon over log epsilon. Okay? So, so this is just a reformulation of what we want. And now it's in a form closer to the form we know of the Lovas local lemma. One can't apply, it turns out, the Lovas local lemma exactly to these sets because uh, it's harder to control their intersection, so one does some smoothing of these sets. So this is the version of the local lemma that we're using. It's a, a one-sided version, and such versions appeared uh, shortly after the original. So you have sets AJ, which have some approximate independence, but usually this is described in terms of a dependence graph here, the sets are given in a sequence. So the dependence graph is actually has a very simple structure that um, you want to think of strong dependence happening between sets in the sequence that are just closely located on the axis. And uh, sets that are far away, well, they're not perfectly independent, but there is a bound on the dependence. So there's some upper bound on this dependence, which is given in terms of some numbers xi. So this is, you know, formulation very close to the original. And of course, you could find, again, ex 
position of this in the Alon Spencer book. And so you have this probability bounded by such a product. Then you can conclude the lower bound for the probability of the intersection of Cosman. So I won't go through you know, exactly what x's you need to choose. You can find this in the paper. But the point is, you apply the, this version of the Lovas local lemma, which, of course, many of you know is first in a joint paper with Erdos. Um, you apply this to the sets AI, which are approximations of the sets EJ, but somehow uh, have some rough edges smoothed out. So the sets AJ are unions of certain binary intervals. So it's a set which is a union of binary intervals of a certain size that approximates the set EJ that appeared, appeared in the previous slide. So the details of carrying this out are you know, just one or two pages of uh, simple calculation, which I won't go through here. Um, but uh, somehow the Lovas local lemma fits this setting like a glove and improves on the, so if you look at the arguments of Kinchin and of Katznelson, these are a very clever manipulation of intervals, but somehow just plugging in correctly to the Lovas local lemma gives a much, much better bound, which you know, I, I, I admit I found surprising. Uh, so it turned out that without uh, our knowing it, actually there is a, quite a community of people in their font and approximation who, that was interested in this problem. In particular, I want to single out uh, Moshe Vitin, who uh, wrote six or seven papers following up uh, to ours, and ours just appeared in 2010, so this is very, very fast, uh, applying the method in very creative ways that were certainly unexpected to us. And I'll just, of these, so Moshe Vitin has several papers and surveys on this topic, all from the last couple of years, which I recommend to look at. I just mentioned one of the applications he has in a joint paper with uh, Bougo. Um, and I just quote from the math review. So this is a paper involving some weak converse of the Littlewood conjecture. So remember, the Littlewood conjecture states that for any alpha and beta, if you take the norm of Q alpha, the norm of Q beta, and multiply that by Q, that will have a info, limit inf of zero. And what they deduced by adapting our, by adapting our argument is that if you, is that you don't have that much room there, so if you just multiply by an extra log squared Q, then you can find lots of alpha beta where this limit is positive. And, and even a set of full house of dimension. So, to prove the Littlewood conjecture, you know, you have to be finer than this log, log squared Q uh, factor. And the point is that this is really, once one has the scheme going, as Moshe Vitin points out, there is a very clear way how to proceed. And he proves a whole variety of questions by adapting this technique in a creative way. So that's. So that's, and again, he has a long survey in Russian math surveys, which uh, details this and many other applications. So <coughs> I want to go on to a different application of the probabilistic method. And uh, this is to another subject with a long history, Kaketa uh, sets or Besikovich sets. So these, one of the, these emerged. So Kakea became one of the most celebrated names in analysis by making uh, the following wrong conjecture. So um, he was looking for shapes in which you could rotate a unit segment, and uh, and the shape should have minimal area. Right, so you want, to, so. And from that point, you know, sets where you could rotate a unit segment inside are called Kakea sets. And his conjecture was that a shape like this is optimal. Um, in particular, such a set must 
contain a unit segment in all directions, but a little more because you have to be able to rotate the segment. Now, historically, this has been distinguished as sets where you can rotate the segment are called Takea sets, and sets where that contain the segment in every direction are called Besikovic sets because he found them, uh, and he found sets of the latter type of measure zero. Uh, but so, but I'm going to suppress this distinction. So, giving all the credit to Besikovic of finding such sets, but we're, we're going to focus on the property of containing a line segment in every a unit segment in every direction, rather than the issue of rotating the segment, which has turned out to have somehow less importance. So Besikovic gave the first deterministic construction of Kakea set. So actually. A, a Kakea set where you can turn the interval cannot have zero area, but it can have arbitrarily small area, and a set, but from now on I'll just abuse notation and call a Kakea set anything which contains a segment in all directions, a unit segment in all directions, and then Besikovic gave constructions of such sets of zero area. In fact, implicitly he had such, such constructions before Kakea even asked the question, but he made this more explicit after the after he learned of the question. And there were later simplifications by uh, Perron, Schoenberg, and uh, those constructions uh, gave Kakea sets. So if you want the Kakea set to have a nice structure, for instance, to consist of four in triangles, then the area cannot be zero, but it can be go to zero with n. And then by properly passing to the limit, one can get area zero. So here's, here are some uh, pictures from uh, Terry Tao's website of uh, a ver version of the classical construction. So start with a triangle. So this one by one triangle has unit segments, not in all directions, but 45 degrees. That's good enough because if you take a union of four copies of that, you'll get all directions. But of course, this has large area. Now suppose you subdivide this triangle in, in two and shift this one piece against the other, then this, this union, well, it still has unit segments in all directions which this one had, right? Because any, seg any unit segment from the apex here to the base, there will still be a shifted version here. But the area is smaller because with this shift, we created some overlap. And then you can repeat that. So you take these triangles and subdivide them and continue shifting. And if you keep doing this, then by suitably shifting, you can make the area smaller and smaller, not very fast, just one over log of the number of triangles you're employing. And eventually, the area can go to zero. And there's some further trickery to actually get a set of area zero, which I won't go into now. So these are some of the classical constructions, and there are various variations. Okay, so we're going to do a new variation of that where the, there is a random element to the construction. Um, and it will be optimal in terms of the rate of decay of the area. So, so this is the kind of set we obtain, but let me say that we really stumbled upon this set because this is not what we set out to do. We set out to analyze, to analyze a certain search game that I'm going to tell you about. And, um, <laughs> and the search game, this game was already analyzed, but the new thing in our work was finding the connection to Kakea set. So this will be a game of pursuit I want to tell you about. Here are a few of the references. This is one of Besikovic's papers, relevant papers, not the first one, but one where he explicitly refers to Kakea's problem from 1928. This is a, a paper by Davies, who in particular shows that any Kakea set in the plane must have Hausdorff dimension two. Uh, the analogous problem in space is an important open problem. In space, you still have Kakea sets that contain unit segments in all directions of zero volume, 
but it's not known what is the minimal possible Hausdorff dimension of such sets. And it's a major open problem. I wish I could say anything about it, but I can't. So you can just repeat the question. Um, so this is the first paper analyzing the uh, pursuit game you'll see in a minute. And this is our paper relating this pursuit game to uh, Kakea sets. And uh, this, 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 certainly the latter two are both easily uh, available online. So here's the game. We have two players, which following Adler et al. we call, uh, we're going to call the hunter and the rabbit. And they c the game can be played on any graph. It turns out the most informative graph is just a cycle or a path. But on any graph, you can play this game. So the rules are the um, hunter and the rabbit start wherever they want on the graph, but they don't see each other. The hunter can either stay in place or move to a neighboring vertex in the graph. So that's what he can do in every move. The rabbit can jump from any vertex in the graph to any other vertex at will. They move simultaneously, but they don't see each other until they happen to land on the same site in which, at which point the rabbit is captured. So, so this can be done on any graph. Again, the hunter has to respect the graph. He's walking from a vertex to a neighboring vertex, or he can rest where he is. The rabbit can just basically has the complete graph, can jump from one vertex to any other vertex. And we're going to first look at it on the cycle, and then at the end come back to general graphs, which uh, uh, turns out that the cycle analysis applies, gives some information on general graphs. Okay, so that's the, the game. As, you know, as I said, it's, you can think of this as being played at night in the sense that they don't see each other until they actually land on the same spot. Um, well, so the game continues until, as I said, they land on the same spot, and that's the capture time. So obviously, the hunter wants to minimize the capture time. The rabbit wants to maximize capture time. So you can think of them as engaged in an infinite horizon or unbounded horizon, a zero-sum game. It is useful in the analysis to reduce to a finite game. So think of a round between the two players as just n steps. So remember, n was the length of the cycle, the number of vertices in the graph. but the so we can define a game GN star, which has the same graph, but we're only looking at the game for n steps. So in n steps, the question is, will the rabbit be caught in these n steps, in this one round or not? This is now a finite game, because the possible strategies for the, uh, for the hunter are about 3 to the n, for the rabbit about n to the n strategies, pure strategies. Uh, they're actually, to optimize, they will have to play mixed strategies. They will have to randomize what they do. Um, but now it's a finite game, so just von Neumann's minimax theorem tells us that there is a value of the game, which means if they both play randomized strategies, it's the probability of capture under optimal play. Uh, now there's a close connection between this probability of capture and the mean capture time in the original game, which is Ignoring constants, and I'll consistently ignore constants here, it's just going to be n over p. If the probability of capture in a one round is p, then the expected capture time is going to be essentially n over p. This p, the probability of capture in a round, will be closely connected to the area of a suitable Kakea set. So, all right, so. So that's, so that's this game. Now, how, what is the connection? Well, certainly any good strategy for the rabbit in, the one, in one round can just be replicated in the next round. So if the rabbit has probability p of being caught in, the best, in one round when it plays optimally against any strategy of the, of the hunter, then it could just repeat that. So the capture time will be at least a geometric variable of parameter p, so the mean will be 1 over p rounds, so the total length in time will be n over p. 
Now, conversely, if the hunter has a strategy that ensures capture probability of P, no matter what the rabbit does, then he can do it in the first round. Now, he can't quite repeat this in the second round because the strategy might tell him to go to a random starting position, and he can't just jump to a new random starting position. But he can do that if he's willing to waste a round, and since we're not caring about constants now, he can just waste one round to go to his next starting position, which is prescribed by the strategy. So uh, by interlacing rounds where he's really trying hard to capture the rabbit and rounds which are just maybe wasted just to move to a new position, you can again easily dominate the capture time by twice a geometric variable of parameter p. So you get, again, 2 over p rounds in expectation, so 2n over p as a bound for the capture time. So, so there is a close connection of the finite game and the unbounded game. Well, now what to do in these games? What should the rabbit do? What should the hunter do? One nice thing about von Neumann's Minimax theorem is that it tells us that once you find the optimal mixed strategy, it doesn't matter if you hide it from the opponent or you declare it to the opponent. Of course, you shouldn't declare the actual path you're taking, but the randomized strategy, if you just declare it, it doesn't change the expectation. It doesn't change the expected payoff. So, well, what could the rabbit do? Let's first look at this, just to get oriented, the simplest things. One thing the rabbit could do is just choose a random node and hide there. In that case, it would typically be captured by time n if the hunter does something reasonable, like sweeping, um, like starting at a random point and just walking for a long time in some random direction, then the capture time will be n. Another thing the rabbit might do is use its jumping powers to just jump to a uniform random point in every vertex, in every time step. But then, again, it will be captured in time n because just whatever, wherever the hunter is, the rabbit has probability 1 over n to land on it in every step. So the capture time will have mean n. And so the natural question here is, well, is the capture time linear? It's a natural question. And what would you suggest for the rabbit and the hunter to do? So one thing that most people, including us, first thought is a natural strategy for the hunter is a zigzag strategy. He starts in a random position, goes in a random direction for time about n, but not exactly n. So say every time he switches direction with probability 1 over n. So he will switch about after order n steps, but in an unpredictable place, and then go in the other direction. So this kind of zigzag strategy looked reasonable. And at first, I couldn't see how a rabbit could evade such a hunter for more than, say, 100 n steps. But it turns out the rabbit can evade the hunter. So here's the rabbit counter strategy. Uh, start at a random starting node, walk root n to the right, then jump to root n to the left and repeat. Let me show this in a picture. So here is the hunter strategy. So this is a very long segment. Think of it as order n. And then you know, occasionally, the hunter stays in place, and occasionally he s switches direction. So these are, and this is on a cycle, so this is periodic. So this is the space-time map of the hunter's location. Time is going vertically, space is horizontally, so this is where the hunter is. <coughs> and these line segments where he's in the same direction are of order n. How does the rabbit respond? As I said, choose a random starting point, walk for root n to the right, jump to root n to the left, root n to the right, and so on. How can such a rabbit be caught? Well, <clears throat> by if the hunter is going to the right, remember the hunter is staying in the same direction for a long time. If he's going to the right, then the only way he will catch the rabbit in a round is if he's going in one of these root n lines that the rabbit is using. Right? Because in one round, the rabbit just uses root n lines to the right. So this has chance 1 over root n. The other way is, well, what if the hunter is going to the left in this round? Well, if you look at the path of the rabbit here, it's actually contained in a strip 
So, so look here. It's contained in a strip of width root n. Right? So I hope you see this. So this, this path, because of root n to the right, two root n to the left, and so on, there is a strip going to the left of, of width root n. So the only way the hunter going to the left will catch this rabbit is if he happens to choose his path. So remember, the hunter is going for a long time in the same direction. So he ha if he happens to choose his path intersecting this strip, which again has only chance 1 over root n. So whether he's going to the right or going to the left, he only has a chance of order 1 over root n to catch the rabbit in a round. So he will need about root n rounds, that is n to the 3 half, to catch this rabbit. So far, far from linear. And n to the 3 halves is actually the truth for this hunter strategy. So this is the optimal rabbit counter strategy. But still, n to the 3 half seems like a lot. So it turns out what was bad for the hunter here is that although his location at every step was unpredictable, his speed was predictable. And the rabbit counter strategy cleverly exploited this predictability. So the key for the hunter to do better is also to make his speed unpredictable. And here is essentially the optimal. So the optimal hunter strategy is choose a random location and a random speed and then move at that random speed. And that can be implemented in various ways. Here is one way. So you choose A and B uniform in 0, 1. Uh, so you start at A times N, mod N. And then you move to a time t, you're at a n plus b t. So because b is less than 1, this is a possible move. If you move, if t increases by 1, this will increase by either 0 or by 1. So in this strategy, the hunter is always either staying in place or moving to the right. He's not even exploiting possibility to move to the left. And the claim is that with this strategy, the probability the hunter will catch the rabbit in a round will be much better than 1 over root n. In fact, it will be 1 over log. And, and so this will give a capture time of n log n. By the way, just to check with the chair, when, when do I? Five minutes, OK. So, um, <coughs> okay, so what capture time does this yield? Well, this can be done, once you have the right strategy, it's very easy to analyze with the second moment method. So if Kn is the number of collisions of the rabbit and the hunter, you know, one collision will finish the game. But in the analysis, it's good to look at the whole round and count collisions. And then uh, the, the key is to find the expected number of collisions and the second moment. And these are straightforward. Again, the rabbit is employing an arbitrary strategy here. The hunter is employing this random speed strategy I mentioned. And the expected number of collisions is just one, because in any time, the hunter location is completely uniform. Uh, the, so at any specific time, the probability of collision is exactly 1 over n. So the expected number of collisions in the round is 1. Given that there is a collision, the probability of colliding immediately after say, k steps later, turns out to be 1 over k. So if they collide at some time, then the, the, there's enough uncertainty in the hunter's location after that collision that no matter what the rabbit does, it can't, uh, the probability of collision will be at most 1 over k, and that controls the second moment. So you just use this second moment inequality, uh, sometimes called Daily Zygmunt, but it's just an immediate consequence of Cauchy Schwartz that the probability k n positive is bounded below by this ratio of first moment squared divided by second moment. And in this case, it's 1 over log n. So this is the lower bound for the capture probability. And I'm going to skip the verification of the second moment. Um, OK, now what about, what about the rabbit? So it turns out that n log n is the truth for this problem. So the rabbit can also find the strategy where the probability of capturing a round is at most 1 over log n. So it means log n rounds will be needed for capture. And in describing and analyzing this strategy, we'll use the upper bound. The probability of k n positive is at least the expected number of collisions in time, till time 2n. So we continue the strategies for time 2n. 
divided by the expected number given that they have collided in the first n steps. And you just say that in order, I'm going to skip to some details and say that in order to succeed, the rabbit wants to find a strategy where if it collides with the hunter, then there will be many collisions after that, as many as possible. And it turns out what the rabbit wants to do is a Cauchy random walk. So, um, so rabbit will uh, you know, use its jumping powers, but not to jump to a uniform spot. It will jump a jumping distribution where the probability to jump exactly distance k is like constant over k squared. And, um, and this will maximize the chance that after one collision with the hunter, there will be many collisions afterwards, which paradoxically perhaps is what the rabbit wants. It wants to concentrate the possibility of collision. So if it collides once, it's going to be dead, but it wants, so, and the total no average number of collisions is fixed. So it wants to concentrate these bad events in as few paths as possible. And, uh, and this is um, how it, it gets done. So I'm going to have to uh, skip some details, but say how this Cauchy distribution can be implemented. So the rabbit doesn't have to know about the Cauchy distribution. What it will do is the following. So think of kind of, a sp again, a space-time diagram of we have the cycle and at time zero, another cycle at time one, another cycle at time two, and so on. The rabbit will do a random walk on the space-time diagram and wait until it first reaches the next rung of the diagram. So it starts at time zero. Now do a random walk on this cylinder and wait till you reach the next rung. So the next location you will reach the rung has an approximate Cauchy distribution. So it will be a kind of thought experiment of a random walk on a space-time diagram, and it will tell it where to jump in the next rung. So I'm going to have to skip the details because I do want to tell you what's the connection to the Kakea set. So let's look again at this problem. So let RT be any rabbit strategy. And now it's convenient to think of time as continuous, but the rabbit strategy is just a step function because it only jumps at integer times. Uh, now, the hunter strategy was using a n plus b t. I took A to be uniform in 0, 1. From this picture, it's more convenient to take A to be uniform in minus 1, 1. It doesn't matter a bit because we're taking everything mod, mod 1. So, so the Hunter strategy will be to go to A n plus B t at time t. And these will collide in, in the time interval between m and m plus 1. For a collision to occur is an event like this. A n plus B m should be between R m and A n plus B m plus 1. And remember, A and B are chosen uniformly. So in parameter space, the event of collision corresponds to this triangle. So the triangle is, its slope is fixed by the time, but its base is shifted by the rabbit strategy. So, so it turns out that the rabbit strategy just amounts to taking these triangles and shifting them <laughs> so as to minimize the area, because the total area of the union of these triangles corresponds to which parameters A, B used by the hunter will the hunter capture the rabbit. And the rabbit wants to minimize this capture probability. So the cleverness needed to construct the good strategy for the rabbit turns out to be very close, essentially the same, to the cleverness needed in order to shift the triangles to get small area. Now, that's not exactly right, because in this problem, the rabbit also has to confront other possible hunter strategies. That's why it has to use a randomized strategy, while for the <laughs> for just constructing a chaos set, you don't need to do randomization. But it's still very, very close, and you get this kind of set. So again, the paper is available in the archive if you want to see more details. So I have two comments to, uh, to make. So one is that one can take a limit. Two, two minutes, I'm almost done. So one can take a limit of these constructions to get 
a, an explicit, simple formula for, so one can think of a game run in the continuum to get an explicit formula for a Kakea set using the Cauchy distribution. So again, a Cauchy process, xt, can be defined explicitly by running a Brownian motion, waiting till it hits a line of height p, and the point where it hits, call that xt, that's a Cauchy process. Okay, it has, it's a one stable process. And then here is a, just a simple formula for a Kakea set. Uh, so you let xt be the Cauchy process, and look at the set A, xt plus at, where at range between zero and one. So you can see that it contains all direction from zero to 45 degrees just by uh, fixing t. So when you fix t and let a run from zero to one, this gives you, um, this gives you a line of slope t. On the other hand, when you fix, so that's why this contains uh, lines in all directions. On the other hand, when you fix, when you fix a, you're going to get the path of a Cauchy process with drifts, and that's classical that that has zero length. So you get, uh, this has zero length, and then by Fubini, the set has zero area. Okay, and um, so, so the very last slide is, a, uh, is about a, why this gives you something for general graphs and what's the open problem. So if you have a general graph, what you do is you pick a spanning tree in the graph and do a depth first search in the spanning tree. So that's what's pictured here. This will give you kind of a cycle going around the tree, visiting every edge twice. Uh, so <laughs> uh, the hunter can use the good strategy for the cycle, applying to it to this cycle. And so since he can capture the rabbit in time n log n on the cycle, he can capture the rabbit in time, well, 2n log n, 2n log 2n on any graph, because he can just use the cycle, and the fact that the cycle has self-intersections only helps the hunter. So n log n is an upper bound, n is a lower bound. Um, okay, and the open problem is, suppose the hunter and the rabbit are both restricted to the graph. So the rabbit lost its jumping powers. It can only walk on the graph. Is it true that on any graph, now the capture time is order n? This, we know it in many, maybe in any specific graph we've looked at, but we don't know it in general. Thanks for your attention.